lately I've been talking about spiritual senses and sharpening our senses. Um, and I was kind of on a roll in a direction, but the Lord has changed my direction. I was going to talk about conscience today, but I'm not now because it wasn't life-giving to me. I just, you know, there was no anointing on it. So um, the direction he was taking me in was something I've been studying that I thought was just for myself. But the Lord is showing me it's, it's for this class, too. Um, so it's, it's still a, along the lines of aligning our senses with the Lord. And, and actually, we'll get into um, today some hindrances to sharpening our senses. And then, hopefully, can't promise it, next week we'll talk about um, the opposite, ways that we do sharpen our senses, specific ways we can sharpen. But today we'll talk about hindrances. Um, and first, I just want to introduce the topic by going to 2 Kings chapter 6. We're going to find Elisha in an interesting situation. Lord, we thank you for your word today and for speaking to us from your word. Father, we just... Um, something he's been teaching me lately. Lord, we present our senses to you right now out of it's Romans chapter 6 we present our members to you God we present ourselves to you and Lord we ask that you would open the eyes of our understanding open our ears open every sense we have our pores even God in the spirit realm um, our spirit man has everything that our physical man has Lord and we just ask that you'd open us up and sensitize us God, as we're in your word, that you would just, just shine your light, Father, on specific things that each one of us individually needs to hear from you this week, Lord. And we just uh, thank you that you are the great teacher, Lord, and that you're going to take us deep, God, in Jesus' name. Okay, so in 2 Kings chapter 6, <clears throat> I'm going to kind of take it slow and start at verse 8. Now, the king of Aram, Aram, was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing that place, because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place, indicated by the man of God, which was Elisha. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, Tell me, which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? And they responded, None of us, my lord the king. But Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. <laughs> Isn't that cool? <laughs> that... The Lord, even in the Old Testament, no Holy Spirit inside. I mean, you know, as, as Mike, he, uh, Mike Shreve had written a song, you know, there were times when God would um, put people on like a glove. He would, he would be on the outside. He would encompass them. He would fill them in the Old Testament. But for the most part, he came upon them. And in the New Testament, now obviously we know the Holy Spirit's in us. So it was a little different. But yet look at what Elisha could do. Just in relationship with God, he could hear from God about what was going on with the enemy king. He knew exactly what he said. He's an example for us, just like Jesus is an example for us of how we can live and how we can walk. He can show us things. He can speak to us about specific things that our kids are doing. I have a kid in the room. <laughs> or, or our boss, you know, it means something's gonna happen at work, you know, and we can know it before they ever tell us in person. Why would we wanna know it? prepare your heart, make other plans, other arrangements, whatever it might be. The Lord can do that. So he did that with Elisha, and he showed him. We can even know, you know what the enemy is up to, because we still have an enemy. And what maybe roadblocks he's putting in the road down, down the way. And we can know ahead of time through dreams and visions, and God just speaking to us, like warning dreams, like I had with putting the life of God in the back seat of my car of life, you know, and, and the life of God died in a car seat because I strapped it down. I had shared this dream a long time ago. Um, Your BP fly. <laughs> Get away. Sorry. It's some paper maybe that's why it. Um, so we can have, you know, God can speak to us about things that are coming and then we can pray and we su can succeed mm -hmm. instead of failing. So he did this with Elisha. Take it as an example of how you can walk and live. Don't just take it as a Bible story. This guy in the Old Testament got to do this. No, I get to do this. 
I get to walk in this. So then in verse 13, he says, go, find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back, he's in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there, and they went by night and they surrounded the city. When the servant, Gehazi, of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Okay, so there's a situation that's not so good. You know, you go out and the car um, won't start. Or you have some other problem in life and you're like, oh no, what am I going to do now? Great. So our reaction in the natural is towards natural things that we're seeing. Gehazi, the servant, could only see in the natural. He could only see the problem. He could only see the enemy forces surrounding them. And then comes Elisha in verse 16. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. So he knew something that Gehazi didn't know. He had a different perspective. Oh no, what are we going to do? Well, don't be afraid. Wait, you know two different things. Oh no, what are we going to do? That guy only knows the problem. Don't be afraid. He knows the solution. He knows the answer to the problem. Where am I at? Yeah, 16. So the prophet answered, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. So we see here an example of a person in the natural who had eyes for the natural, but the Lord opened his eyes in the spirit so he could see. And there's another example of spiritual eyes. So if they had to ask for Gehazi's eyes to be opened... We can ask and need to ask for our eyes to be open. On the other hand, Elisha was just living in the presence of God, and he didn't have to ask. His eyes were always open because he probably had asked before. <laughs> he had already gone through this process of asking for his eyes to be open, and the Lord had already opened them, and they were staying. They were remaining open. So he was practicing certain things in his life to keep his eyes open. So when there's a problem in the natural, I mean, can you imagine, um, you know, some other country invading our nation and all of a sudden we're surrounded as a church with armed forces and tanks and things? We'd be like, oh, you know, panic stricken. Oh my goodness. People parachuting in like in Red Dawn or whatever that movie was, you know, they're attacking, they've got machine guns, they're coming after us. In the natural, that would be very frightening. But... You could have a different perspective. While everyone's diving for cover, you may be able to stand up and say, don't be afraid. <laughs> I see something else. Those, they can't see it, and I can see it. We're surrounded by something more powerful than that. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked in the spirit and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. As the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike this army with blindness. So the Lord told him what to do. There were, there were um, horses and chariots of fire. There were people or, or spiritual beings there, angels there to protect them and solve the problem. And the Lord said, okay, I want you to speak out your mouth now. Strike them with blindness. I think it's interesting that God opened Gehazi's spiritual eyes and then he blinded the enemy's natural yeah. eyes. Yeah, like there's something here about eyes, obviously, mm -hmm. and seeing. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so he struck them with blindness and Elisha, as Elisha had asked. So that's, there's more to it, and it's really interesting, but we don't need to go on with it because there's so much more you could learn in that. Um, so we need to see from God's perspective, and it's all about what we know. It's all about what we know. If we can see from God's perspective, we will know something different and be able to deal with life circumstances in a totally different way. We won't react, you know, like be reactionary. We will respond in faith because we can see something. But we have to get ourselves into position to hear and to see. Um, so our natural eyes, I want to make this quick point, are a gate. Chris and I were talking the other day and about allergies <clears throat> and how when a person has allergies, like they manifest coming out of the eyes. You get itchy eyes, you know, you get watery eyes, your nose. 
Um, you know, your nose gets runny or it gets all stuffed up and swollen. And um, there, are, there are gates in our lives. Kids get infections and it's in their ear, you know, and they have ear problems. These are openings, they're orifices, they're gates. And we do have an eye gate, we have a mouth gate, we have ear gates. And I wrote something down here that I'll just, I might as well just read to you. Um, what I view with my eyes or my senses, my ears, taste, touch, smell, can allow either demonic or godly things in or godly things out. <clears throat> or, in the case of casting out a demon, demonic things out. Um, it's the same in the spirit realm with our senses. We have gates. So we use our natural eyes and natural ears as physical gates to bring in spiritual things. Isn't that interesting how God uses both? He uses the physical. If you, if you see um, a movie that is you know, introducing something to your spirit man that's evil, well, it's coming through your natural eyes, your natural ears, but it's affecting your spirit. Mm -hmm. So it's all intertwined. It's all connected. And God's using the physical. So he'll let us see things. Sometimes I'll be reading a book, and I'll read, read about something, and then a couple days later I'm ministering to someone, and I prophesy over them, and he uses what I read in that book two days ago, and he speaks it out. And I, my, my natural mind is saying and reasoning and justifying, oh, I just read that. That's why I'm saying it. No, they had just had that same prophecy a month before that, and the same words were spoken. God just had to get it into my natural eyes or my natural ears so it could get into my spirit so it would be there, prepared as a tool to give to that person. He does that. He uses our physical to affect our spirit. And it's like so surface level, but yet it goes so deep. I think it's a really deep truth that we'd have to really dig and dig to get to. So the battle is won or lost at the gate. The battle in life is won or lost at the gate. We renew our minds through what we see, what we read, what we hear as we're listening to people teach throughout the week. We renew our minds by whatever's coming in our gates. And the battle is won or lost at the gate, at our eyes, at our ears. Um, if you stop bringing into yourself what the Lord wants you to be learning about, what he wants you to study, what he wants you to do, then you're losing your battle. I just heard someone say recently, you could fast one 24-hour period and make great advances in the spirit and then go four days and not spend time with the Lord and you, you, you've lost ground. You were gaining ground and then you just slid back for those four days. We have to be every single day feeding our spirits, taking that manna from heaven into our, our, into our eyes, into our ears, filling ourselves up through the natural gate to feed our spirit man so we can be strong in the spirit. Um, and then I, and I wrote down something else. Aligning your senses, I put equals, let's see, learning, learning to keep your gates open to God and closed to the enemy. Always staying engaged with heaven. Always engaged. Always locked in to the purposes of God. Every day, every morning, waking up saying, Lord, what do you have for me today? You know, worshiping him and praising him and reading his word as he directs what he tells you to read, not what you think you should read. I, I, that is so important to just follow that flow of what does he have to teach you next? Mm -hmm. And that will link to something else that he wants to teach you. And he'll get these truths down deep into you. So learn to keep your gates open to God and close to the enemies and the, the enemy. That's also recognizing what we're thinking about, recognizing what we're dwelling on. That's a gate. That's a gate. We can change. We can change what we're thinking about. Okay, so now I want to get into a few specifics, things that close our gates to heaven or hinder our sharpening of our spiritual senses. And some of them are, well, they're probably all going to be obvious to you, but yet none of us is a spiritual giant yet. <laughs> so we must not be practicing these things, you know, Maybe. consistently over time because that's what brings success, consistency over time, doing the right thing. So number one, which we've been talking about for a long time, is intimacy or lack of intimacy. You know, well, just turn with me to Hebrews chapter 3. <laughs> <laughs> I feel today my mouth is not lining up with my brain. <laughs> Come on, mouth, get in line. 
So the Lord had me in Hebrews 3 and 4, and I, I, like I said earlier, I thought it was just for me. It's about rest. I, I taught at the women's ministry meeting here uh, a few weeks ago about just entering God's rest, walking in rest. And then I had some prophetic things given to me about rest, and I've had some dreams about rest. And, but it's for this class, too, because whatever I'm learning, the Lord is having me teach. So, let's just start with Hebrews 3, verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus. Liz, fix your thoughts on Jesus. Whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all of God's house. So in this whole section, as I keep reading, there are two key points, faithfulness and house, the word house, before we even get to my first point about intimacy. The Lord's been speaking to me about faithfulness, about not drawing back. As we're seeking God and we're learning to come closer to him and we're learning to hear his voice and go deeper and experience his presence and just really be on fire and living for God, there, he's been warning me, don't draw back. Don't draw back. I, I haven't, you know, I haven't drawn back. <laughs> if anything, I'm like, come on, God, show up more. <laughs> You're not showing up enough for me. And I think he's saying, like, you know, if I don't show up the way you want, you're tempted to draw back because I'm not doing it the way you want because you're still in a box that you think you're not in, <laughs> but you are. And so he's saying Moses was faithful in all of God's house. Jesus has been found worthy, in verse 3, of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house. You ever noticed how many times house is used in this section? <laughs> Bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as the Son over God's house, and we are his house. If we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. So staying tight with Jesus is going to keep our house intact. Now, before he took me to the subject of rest that's coming, he was teaching me about 1 Corinthians 14, 4. When you pray in an unknown tongue, your spirit prays and you, you edify yourself. You, the person who prays in a tongue edifies himself. The word edify means to build a house. <laughs> when you pray in tongues, you're building your house. You're building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, Jude, from the book of Jude. So he's saying, be faithful and let your house be built. Build your house up strong. You could have a little house, or you could have a great big strong house. It's like a mansion. It has a deep basement that goes down like foundation, roots, strong, cannot be blown over by the storm or the wind because you've got a big strong house that's beautiful and decorated and full of lots of things that you can bless other people with. You're, you're rich, you're wealthy, your house is strong. Praying in the Holy Spirit is part of, is a huge key. Praying in tongues every day for a period of time. And I keep mentioning this at different weeks, and I haven't actually taught in depth on it yet. Praying in tongues will build up your house, among other great things that we're already doing. So it's just a key I wanted to share. We are his house, if indeed we hold firmly. So we need to make our houses strong. Verse 7. So as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice... Do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. So this is a prophetic word to the Israelites. But yet, you know, we've probably all rebelled at some point in time to God and, and hardened our hearts. Simply by not doing what he tells us to do, that brings a layer of hardness over our hearts. He tells you to go bless somebody. He tells you to give something away. He tells you to pray. He tells you to read the word. He tells you to fast. He tells you to do this and that and those things and give up this and strike this from your, the record. You know, forget this memory. Don't live under the confines or the dictates of this memory or this experience or whatever it is he told you. 
Every time we don't obey him, there's a little bit of hardness that enters into our hearts. Now, that hardness can be softened. You know, it can be taken away easily, quickly. But we have to seek the Lord for it and get in his presence, and he softens our heart. And we begin obeying, you know, we repent, and then all of a sudden that softness comes back in. It's, it's so undoable, you know, it's fixable. Um, okay, so let's go on. So do not harden your hearts if you hear his voice. During the time of testing, as you did in the rebellion, during the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested and they tried me, even though for 40 years they saw what I did. That, that, I, that is why I was angry with that generation. I said their hearts are always going astray. And they have not known my ways. So I declared an oath on, an, on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. The word rest means repose, like rest, to kick back. It also means a dwelling, a habitation, a house. <laughs> they shall never enter this place, he said, because of their disobedience, because of their lack of intimacy. Basically, they didn't know my ways. They're not going to enter this place of living with me in this house, this dwelling place, this um, habitation of closeness. When you live in a house with somebody, you get to know them well. I, I know a lot of people who live in community or a number of people, and they talk about living in community, just like a family where you have to have agreements and you have to have rules and you have to express your feelings so you don't get offended and move out, you know, and you have to, you really get to know people whether you want to or not because you're living in community. When we live with God in our house actively, he's always been there since you got born again, but when you actively start living with God in your dwelling place, in your house, then you begin to learn his ways. He said, their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. So I went back to Exodus, like 15 and 16 and 17, and I was looking. We're not going to actually turn there right now, but I was looking at this. What, did he, what was he talking about? I've, I've read it before. I've heard the stories, but... You know, he, would, he provided manna and quail, and he's like, only pick up this much. So some of them did, and then others went out and hoarded it. They picked up extra, and then it rotted, and it stunk, you know? And they, he kept telling them, do this, just do this. And they would not listen. They would not obey. And he got mad, and he's like, Moses, what is up with these people? Why aren't they listening to me? You know, he said that to Moses, and I was asking the Lord last night, why did you say that to Moses? It wasn't, you know... <laughs> He's not in control of these people. He can't force them to obey you. Why did you? He was expressing, Moses was his friend. He was expressing his frustration to his friend with these people. Why won't they just listen? Why won't they just obey? Well, because they had fear in their hearts, for one. When you hoard, you have fear. You're afraid you're going to run out. You're going to starve, you know? So for 40 years, he took care of them, you know, the fire and the cloud and the, you know, leading them through the wilderness and water out of a rock. But that was only because they were shouting at Moses and he thought they were going to kill him, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they, they just would not trust God. They would not live in a place of rest and a close, intimate place of dwelling with God. So that's what he wants for us. That's a hindrance to sharpening our spirits and hearing from God and being close. If we don't have intimacy, if we don't know his ways, and we go astray in our hearts, our hearts get drawn away to other things. You know, the lust of the flesh entices us to other things, and we lose interest in God. So if we don't know his ways, we will get drawn away from developing spiritually. They could have learned his ways. Oh, he provides this every morning. I'm only taking this much and it will be sufficient. He will meet my needs. Those were his ways for them. For me, I've learned he'll speak something into my heart, a rhema word, or give me a dream, and I won't understand it right away, maybe. But days later, he will show me what it means. I'll be reading a book that he led me to or listening to someone teach, and all of a sudden, click. Oh, that's what that dream meant. I had no idea. That's what it meant. So I've learned his ways in my life. I need to be patient and just trust him. If he shows me something that I don't get, I just need to wait and the interpretation will come. The meaning will come and I can live it out. 
If I feel like he's far away for a couple days, oh, I just need to ask him what to do. I might just need to sit in, in a quiet place and just tell him how thankful I am. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, psh, the presence falls. I might just need to worship him. Instead of doing the same thing I do every day, I might need to break out and do something different. Those are his ways. He wants us to follow him closely to learn his ways. You know, how does Natalie run her household? How does she, you know, do laundry? How does she grocery shop? How, those would be her ways. If you really get to know Natalie, you're going to know how she does things. That would be her ways. And then you'd be close, you'd be intimate with Natalie because you'd know so much about her. It's the same with God. How does he function? How does he flow? How does he direct you? How does he speak to you? It might be a little different than he speaks to me. But we've got to learn and know his ways. They were always going astray in their hearts because they didn't know his ways. Okay, we'll do one more, and I've got like six of them, so we'll continue next week. Um, the next one is in verse 12. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. So we see a sinful, unbelieving heart will turn us away from the living God. Obviously, right? That's obvious. Um, but what I have written down is not believing that this is my inheritance. Intimacy with God, hearing his voice, being directed by his spirit to become whatever he's called me to be to impact this earth is my inheritance and it's your inheritance. And if you don't believe that this is your inheritance, it's your right to walk in the fullness of God, to walk in the power of God, to walk in everything he has laid out for you, even the things you don't have a clue about yet. He's got a great calling that will totally fulfill you. But if you don't believe that's your inheritance, then that is a sinful, unbelieving heart. That's a heart that doubts him. That's a heart that says, I'm not worthy. Yeah, I'm not good enough. Look at the mistakes I've made, or look at who I am. I just don't have anything to give. That's a sinful, unbelieving heart. Feeling unworthy. <clears throat> um, and then a little cross-reference in chapter 3, verse 19. Um, it says, so we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Their unbelief. They didn't believe that he would take care of them. So do we know his ways well enough to know that he will take care of us? Do we know his ways well enough that when we get into a situation with family or a ministry type situation that he will come through for us? That he'll do whatever needs to be done. He'll, he'll direct us. That he has our ears and if I'm submitting myself, my ears, my eyes to him, then he will direct me. He will speak to me and I will hear him because his sheep know his voice. We know the sound of his voice and that's knowing his ways, becoming familiar with the sound of our Papa's voice. That's, that's awesome and so important for us to do that. All right, well, I'm going to stop here because we are going to minister to Linda.